Hi, happy Mother's Day. My name is Havla Gianetta, and I just started a GoFundMe campaign for a nonfiction book that I'm trying to finish. And um, as part of that campaign, I'm going to share some of my writing. So in honor of Mother's Day, I'm actually going to read an excerpt from chapter one, some childhood memories about my Creole grandmother, whom I called Mama. Half of my family's Italian and white from New Jersey. The other half is black, uh, Louisiana Creole. And um, I'm sad to say that she passed away last year, but my mama was a force of nature and I love remembering her through my work. So uh, let's begin and just let you know I start every excerpt with a quote. So. Every culture has its Southerners, people who work as little as they can, preferring to dance, drink, sing, brawl, kill their unfaithful spouses, who have livelier gestures, a wonderful sense of rhythm and charm, charm, charm. Unambitious, no, lazy, ignorant, superstitious, uninhibited people, never on time, who for all their poverty and squalor lead enviable lives. Envied, that is, by work-driven, sensually inhibited, less corruptly governed northerners. For if you start dancing on tables, fanning yourself, feeling sleepy when you pick up a book, developing a sense of rhythm, making love whenever you feel like it, then you know the South has got you. Uh, and that's an abridged quote from Susan Sontag's The Volcano Lover. All right. I was pretending to be Shere Khan from the Jungle Book when a knock sounded on the front door. And when I opened it, I found two unwelcome faces smiling down at me. Mama and Papi, Preston's parents. Ha, darling. I looked up into Mama's fine features and decided I didn't like the auburn tinge of her hair dye. Now, ain't you the sweetest little lady? We just need to do something about that hair now, don't we? I stared back at her, silent. I was suspicious of Daddy's parents from the moment they arrived, and not just because they reminded me of him. Well-dressed and well-mannered as always, Mama and Papi stepped inside Diana's house, patting my frizzy curls and offering me stiff hugs while I wondered what they were doing so far from their na native ha habitat. Something about their mannerisms put me on edge. I would soon learn that this dislikable quality was called politeness, which adults seemed to think meant lying in ways that made other adults more comfortable. But that's what Mama and Papi preferred, so I didn't give them much affection and they didn't seem to mind. Besides, I was happy to tolerate our arrangement because it provided me with access to a city like no other, New Orleans. I always relished the times Mama would walk me to the French Quarter and ask, what would you like from the shops today, baby doll? And I'd lay my hand on a Mardi Gras mask fringed with peacock feathers, or a Spanish folding fan paneled with silk and black lace, or an Egyptian-styled wrap woven with gold thread. In response, she'd croon, yes, ma'am, anything for my baby. My heart cheered pretty things, pretty things, as I accepted each gift like it was destined to be mine. Then I'd clutch my spoils and observe other shoppers as Mama finished purchasing her goods. Merchandise wasn't the only fun thing to look at in New Orleans. The city seemed to operate like a grand theater, with the unspoken rule that its citizens dress in costume, whether or not it was Mardi Gras. After all, my great-grandmother Delphine won the Louisiana Weekly's Best Dressed category during at least one carnival season, and a quick glance of her bursting closet showed why. I explored them for hours, losing myself in decades of costumes and jewelry and trying on her vast array of wigs, until it dawned on me that she wore them both for show and out of necessity. Like many black women of her era, Delphine was expected to make herself more presentable by straightening her hair, and a lifetime of relaxers had burned her scalp bald. Years later, I would be surprised to learn that New Orleans was nicknamed the Big Easy because when I wasn't in front of the mirror playing dress up, I was running at the mercy of Mama's schedule. Her friends and relations must have burned calories by socializing because going out on the town with Mama was practically a competitive sport. 
There was always another dinner party or club meeting to attend, and there was also her church and the endless activities associated with it. Now, child, I tell you, I remembered Auntie Number One saying during one of my visits, I saw Callie on Sunday, and you know what? The women in my grandmother's parlor stopped talking as she set down her cordial glass and puckered her lips, leaning forward like a bomb was about to drop off her tongue. I munched my pralines faster, anticipating scandal. That girl was up at mass looking like she was about to clean somebody's kitchen. I mean, up in church with nothing on but a house dress and curlers in her hair. Now you know that is a shame. I swung my legs in my too tall chair, curious as to why it was bad to wear curlers to church. As always in New Orleans, I was stuffed into an uncomfortably pretty dress and my puffs of hair were parted several ways, slicked down with pomade, and twisted in the colorful hair baubles I've only seen black girls wear. A damn shame, Annie number two drawled as she cocked a round hip. A chorus of dark eyes fluttered in disapproval as several husky mm-hmms peeled through the parlor. Girl, Annie number three purred like an announcer on smooth jazz radio. That ain't the first time I've seen that. She fanned herself as her sable hand reached for a sweet tea. It's one thing when young people up in church with their nappy heads and miniskirts, but it's just sad when people our age don't show some respect. That's right, a caramel tone cousin batted her long lashes in agreement. Would Sister Roberta let any of us stroll on up in catechism dressing like a trick? Ani number two huffed, her breasts and rump swaying in concert as she, as she sashayed from kitchen to coffee table words dripping like honey from her mouth. Nuh-uh, honey pie. Well, Sister Roberta could kiss my black ass. And she knew it, too, Mama trilled. Throaty snickers broke out around us as my mama leaned a petite elbow on her armrest and continued gossiping with snobbish grace. Mama never sugarcoated what it was like to be black and Catholic back in the day. The needlessly harsh punishments, the white nuns playing favorites with the lighter-skinned students and ignoring the darker ones. The time a priest asked if she touched herself during confession when she was just eight years old. Once, when Mama was caught chewing gum in Sunday school, she mashed the sticky wad above her ear before any of the nuns could grab it. And she didn't regret the bald spot where they had to shave it out of her hair either. Keeping her gum was an act of civil disobedience, a small triumph against her church's rigid policies. But Mama could never not be Catholic. Over the years, her dark eyes would dart at me as she grunted, That's why we're here, baby doll. You and me, we soldiers for Jesus. Because that's what it's all about, helping out your fellow man. And Mama lived those words, educating hundreds, if not thousands, of elementary school students, volunteering with numerous organizations, and working with people with disabilities even after she retired. Her faith fed her humanitarianism, providing her with the energy to give back for the rare blessing of growing up in a well-to-do black household during segregation, and to give back for outshining almost everyone she knew by earning her Master of Education from Harvard. Attending the nation's most elite university wasn't Cecile's happiest experience, but she'd been chosen. Oh, Dr. Michael, I can still see Mama raising a hand and pursing her lips as she imitated one of her former Harvard classmates. Why can't the Negro students pronounce their ERs correctly? Probably the same reason white people in Massachusetts can't pronounce their ARs correctly, Cecile thought as she flushed at the insult but she kept the jab to herself, even though she and her Southern compatriots were caught off guard by the thick Boston dialect that surrounded them off campus. It was the first time Cecile had ever been in class alongside white students, and she was determined to stay above reproach. Right. Well, that's a fair question, Miss Pris. I'm afraid I don't know. Professor Michael gestured toward the cluster of brown-skinned outsiders where Cecile was sitting. Perhaps one of them would care to give a response. Pardon me, Cecile responded, masking her anger as she over-enunciated her words. I can't speak for all Negro students, 
but I think maybe it's a Southern habit, no matter one's color. Although Harvard College wouldn't admit women until the 1970s, the university's graduate school began accepting them as early as 1920, and in 1939, Rose Butler Brown made history as the first black woman to earn her doctorate in education from Harvard University. But now, the year was 1953, Brown versus Board of Education was being tossed around the Supreme Court, and Harvard had to make a statement to be seen leading the way to social enlightenment before integration became a federal mandate. Dillard University was Southern and historically Black, so six of its graduate students, Cecile among them, were handpicked to become examples of America's future unity by enrolling in a Harvard's Master of Education program. The Ford Foundation even paid their tuition. But what seemed like Cecile's path to success turned out to be a lonely road filled with willful ignorance and social ostracism. Still, she and her fellow trailblazers gritted their teeth through the petty snubs and dismissive attitudes. For better or worse, Harvard's social climate prepared them for the years of false accusations, gaslighting, and injustice life would hand them for being not just Black, but accomplished. Now that I'm grown, I understand why I couldn't shake the feeling that Mama was always acting, because in a sense, she was. It wasn't genuine, that slow southern yawn that protracted the mannerisms of Mama and the Creole women around her. Even though they worked harder than black men and twice as hard as white folk only to find mediocre success, they chose to camouflage their struggles with an easy breezy facade of southern charm. You won't find photos of my Creole aunties marching in the civil rights movement or hear them talking about oppression from the man. Those black southern bells wanted to glide through society like swans, all lazy elegance on the surface while they were scrambling to stay afloat. Sure, there was the time Mama danced with Martin Luther King Jr. at some convention she barely remembered, but that was where she drew the line. Effortless success was her protest. All right. <coughs> Sorry about the coughing. Been under the weather. But um, that was my excerpt. Uh, thank you for listening. Again, if you want to contribute to my GoFundMe campaign, I will put the details uh, below this video. Oh, and also shout out to Kimberly, who donated like right after my uh, campaign went up. Thank you so much. And again, happy Mother's Day or belated Mother's Day at this point.